So how are we going to accomplish this enormous societal retrofit without some kind of chaotic social breakdown? I think there are three likely strategies that, that, that could be deployed sort of on a, a, a governmental level or, or large-scale societal level. One is the first scenario I, I, I'm calling feudal fascism. That's basically a central government taking charge of, of the whole show and uh, guaranteeing personal safety to folks who manage to maintain some kind of property and, and income uh, by locking everybody else up or putting them into work gangs or, or whatever, work camps. Doesn't look very attractive. Uh, second scenario is what's actually what's now being proposed to deal with the, the uh, the financial crisis, which is a kind of Green New Deal. Now, the way I would frame the Green New Deal is maybe a little more uh, uh, robustly than it's, it's being framed by most folks, because it's not just a matter of uh, creating some jobs for a few thousand people to go out and install solar panels and wind turbines. No, we're talking about rebuilding the entire infrastructure of the country and when I say that, I mean, obviously, that that's, uh, seems like an overblown statement. It's obviously not something we can do in four years or eight years. I'm talking about something that we need to do over the course of the next 40 years. By mid-century, we have to be off of fossil fuels, both because fossil fuels by that time will be extremely scarce and expensive, but also if we want to hope to avert catastrophic climate change. We have to be basically off of fossil fuels by mid-century. And the only way we'll get there is by moving at a very rapid pace to replace our fossil fuel societal infrastructure with a different kind of infrastructure. So one way to do that would be for government to support communities in making the energy transition, uh, organizing a societal retrofit on basically the same basis that we organized the, uh, the WPA project and all of the other alphabet organizations in the 1930s where we built bridges and post offices and so on that we're still using to this day. Well, we don't need more bridges and post offices nearly as much as we need this new societal infrastructure. The third scenario would be, well, assuming that federal government is just too incompetent to do all of this, we could organize it on a community level, uh, on a grassroots basis. And there are efforts to do this going on all over the place. They don't get a lot of press. In Britain, for example, there is the, the transition town movement. How many have heard of the transition towns in Britain? A few folks, most haven't. Uh, dozens and dozens of towns and cities throughout the, the United Kingdom have organized themselves to undergo this energy transition entirely on a, a grassroots bottom-up uh, basis. Now, of course, there are limits to what you can do from that standpoint because a lot of what needs to change can only change with government regulation, large-scale investment, and so on. So, <clears throat> frankly, I think the, the best outcome, the best scenario would be achieved if we have this Green New Deal and if the federal government can support local communities and grassroots organizations to meet in the middle. Because if it's just the federal government imposing this enormous change in priorities and spending and so on, there will be a lot of skeptics. It'll be hard to keep everybody on the same path. We need, we need ordinary folks to be engaged at the m most granular level of society, helping this process along. And we all have to be invested in it together. We have to understand this is not a red project or a blue project. It's not a conservative or a liberal project. It's a survival necessity for our nation and our species. <clears throat> Fortunately, we still have going for us the things that got us into this mess in the first place and that will have to get us out. You know, language is going to be extremely important in all of this because the only way we can shift our thinking quickly enough is if we have messages, societal messages that help us reorganize that thinking to understand that the future is not going to look like the past. 
Yes, we're in a, a deepening recession slash depression today. The only way we're going to get out of that is if we work together. If we put aside our differences and see the challenge before us and say, yes, we could have a great nation in the future, but the only way we're going to get there is if we make some fundamental changes to our attitudes, our expectations, how we, how we transport ourselves, how we grow and distribute our food, all of these things. If we're willing to make some sacrifices and work together, we will have, you know, they say the greatest generation, the World War II generation, we need the greatest generation now to undertake this work. In using language, in messaging, we have to understand that maybe we have seen the end of economic growth as we have pictured it up to this time. We've, we've seen economic growth as always having more stuff, always going faster, and the, the future's not gonna work out that way. After all, we live on a finite planet. There's only so much raw materials. There's only so much stuff we can extract from this planet. We can, however, have growth of a different kind. We can have growth in health, education, uh, cultural uh, products. We can have more interesting and amazing music and science and all the rest. None of these things require that much in the way of material throughput. There's very little correlation, in fact, internationally between happiness and energy consumption. You know, people who live in countries where there's not enough energy to cook food or keep themselves warm, they're not very happy. But as soon as you have those basic things in place, there's no correlation whatsoever. So we could be just as happy as we are now, and in fact, much happier, using a tenth the amount of energy that we're currently using. That's how we have to think, and that's the path that we have to pursue. So I've laid out for you I, what I'm sure is an enormous challenge. I face, I look at this challenge every day and I say, how are we going to do this? Is it possible? Frankly, I don't see any other path that leads to survival, much less prosperity for our species. But Every day, every year, I see more people awakening to, the, to this reality, that this is in fact what we have to do. And now that we have this economic crisis facing us, I think we also have an enormous opportunity. Because suddenly, nature, through, in the form of uh, this credit crisis, is banging on our door saying, I'm sorry, you can't keep doing that anymore. You're gonna have to do something very different now. So what is that very different thing? We're going to have to invent that together as a society, as a people, and we, we know basically, generally, where that's going to take us. It's going to take us to more closely knit communities where we are providing more for ourselves and each other. It's going to take us toward a society where we're more cooperative and less competitive, to a society where we're using less stuff and repairing things and reusing things we're making higher quality things that will last a longer time. And we're placing less value in our things and more value in each other and what we know and what we accomplish. To me, that doesn't sound like a very bad deal, in fact. So I hope we can do that together. Thank you very much.